down the quayside. Apparently there used to be a ducking stool here somewhere. Now ducking stools are things which were used to, uh, people were tied to them if they'd been dishonest and then they were uh, put under water for a certain amount of time and they were pulled up again. This is a punishment uh, for minor infractions. Usually used for women as well. I mentioned earlier about property along the waterfront and I think there we have some wonderful flats. And we should have gone for something like that, of course I don't know how much it would have cost if it would have been within my reach or anything of that nature. In fact it might need to be flats and maybe houses and in which case uh, I wouldn't want such a big place apart from that I couldn't afford such a big place. I couldn't have afforded such a big place. <laughs> Past tense, probably. There we have a wonderful piece of early Victorian construction. In fact, it's even earlier than Victoria. They started building that in 1836. It took them three years to complete it. And look at good condition it's in today. That was a textile mill, but it was built on the site of a former monastery, which was set up sometime in the 13th century. And after the dissolution of the monasteries, it would it would have been uh, the land become vacant. Uh, this mill was put here. Uh, obviously the location because of the water nearby, but also it was a jobs creation scheme, a very early idea of jobs creation. It was put up because of the crisis in the textile trade uh, which, which had developed and it was a, an effort to find employment and it, it worked very, very well as uh, for a number of years. Uh, the just before the First World War, it was bought, or leased I should say, by a company which uh, manufactured, well it was a chocolate manufacturer, but they had their packaging, it was actually produced there, and their crackers were also produced in that building. Uh, after the First World War, it was used as a government training centre for, for people who had returned uh, wounded, injured, maimed. And uh, shortly after that, and, and until 2006, it was, a, uh, it was a publishing company owned it. This is a publishing company still owns it, I, I believe. But they now use it for their head office and their training department. So you see the area around Norwich, which is a bit higher than Norwich. Now, in something related to the Kets Rebellion of 1549, I saw that referred to as a mountain. Well, mountains isn't really. Uh, Norwich is approximately 40 metres uh, above sea level. Uh, East Anglia is noted for being flat. It's not particularly high anywhere. And supposing, maybe by East Anglia standards, it is indeed a mountain. Isn't this a peaceful setting for what is more or less the city centre? I exaggerate a little bit on the city centre there, but not a great deal. We can walk to the market square from here in 10 minutes. out in front of me is the cow tower and that was built in the 15th century and it is one of the earliest examples 
of an artillery position that I know of. It's built to be able to withstand the artillery of the time and also to actually house artillery. As it happened, uh, during the Kets rebellion, it didn't prove to be much use. And there's another thing, if you're thinking of building any positions like this yourself, as it's on lower ground uh, to where the potential energy may be coming from, it's not such a good position. But uh, an outstanding piece of architecture, and it's wonderful that it's managed to survive this, this long. That I find really great. You can see here we've got a bend in the river, so it was, from that point of view, a good place to actually put the tower. So there we have another view of the cow tower. And you can see these slits which were used for bows and arrows, crossbows, so they still had the two technologies there, the, the new gunpowder, but they were still with the, the bows and arrows, which in fact didn't go out of use for much, much later. And the crossbow was still in existence for a great deal of time. across the river to get you a better view of this magnificent bridge which dates back to 1337 and it took four years to build so four years for this wonderful bridge to be built and we have a gatehouse there on the moors and out in front now unfortunately in 1790 the gatehouse had to be pulled down because it was creating too much stress on the bridge itself but this is the oldest bridge in Norwich and I, I really find this quite a magnificent uh, structure and um, it's Bishop's Bridge because it leads into Bishop's Gate Bishop, the way of the bishops and into land which is owned which has always been owned by Norwich Cathedral it was owned by Norwich Cathedral maybe it isn't any longer I stand to be corrected on that one. So let's go over the bridge now. Close to the bridge, we have this plaque, which I'm sure many haven't seen before, including myself, I've just noticed it now. And it's a memorial to somebody who was burnt on the 19th of August, 1531. His name was Thomas Bilney, and he was burnt for spreading the gospel of free salvation by faith, which means he was a Protestant. And we also have a list of people who were burnt in 1557 and 1558 in the reign of Mary Tudor. Many people were burnt, I think there came several hundred. And we, most famous, of course, are those burnings, which, such as uh, Thomas Cranmer, which took place in Oxford. But there were, people were burnt all over the place. Uh, for being Protestants. I need to point out as well that religious persecution uh, believed to be very high in the reign of Mary, but in, in Elizabeth's times it wasn't all that much better. But that's a subject for another occasion. I'll come back to that in another film. I'd like to point out though, in the case of Mr. Burnham, who was born in 1531, now bear in mind, only a couple of years later, Henry VIII declared himself head of the church and uh, in those circumstances it's highly unlikely he would have been burnt um, but declared himself head of the church not because of some religious reason but because he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn and the reason he married Anne Boleyn was she was a, she was a bit of all right she was much more attractive than his 16 years older wife who he wanted to get rid of. Apparently Catherine Aragon was as wide as she was tall, 
so he's obviously turning so, so in a new model. So any nonsense about him wanting a son and all the rest of it, that's, that's a dribble. Well, that's not the reason for the wave of perse religious persecution which happened then. Of course, uh, when Mr Burnley was down there, that wouldn't have uh, made much difference one way or the other. Now, I'm standing on the spot where the gatehouse used to be, and this bridge is a sign, site of fighting during Pletch Rebellion of 1549, and the rebels who had quite reasonable demands relating to uh, lands not being enclosed by wealthy landowners. Very reasonable. In fact, they weren't the, the demands, they were requests. If you read them, you see the requests. They came over this bridge, uh, captured Norwich, it was fighting them in the city centre. They defeated the Royalist armies. Eventually, the uh, forces of Edward VI, who was very young at the time, uh, so it's not really his fault. <laughs> uh, they defeated the rebels using largely using mercenaries from other countries. Robert Kett, who's a great British hero in my opinion, he was hanged from Norwich Castle and his brother was hanged at Wyndham 